Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, I think I know a lot of people on the call today or the webinar, but for those of you who haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Emily Heffling, and I'm the founder at Lifelong Readers. And I'm really excited about today. We're going to jump into our very first webinar thinking about virtual guided reading and specifically virtual guided reading in kindergarten. Now, for teachers on the call right now who have students at levels A to F, steps pre to four in the older grades, this is also applicable to those students as well. So here's our goal for today. Our goal for today is to translate all of our best practices and structures for guided reading from the physical classroom to the virtual classroom. So this isn't about learning a bunch of new instructional techniques or how to teach guided reading. Everyone on the call today has a lot of experience teaching guided reading, has some really great practices. And so what we wanna learn today is how do we take that again from the physical classroom and get it into our virtual classroom? And we are very, very fortunate today because Rachel Shin, who you see on the screen, she has been experimenting with this for about three weeks now, doing three groups, four days a week. And so she has a wealth of experience. She has learned so much. And we are going to watch her videos today to learn directly from her. And we're really fortunate because at the end of the session, she is gonna come on, her camera will come on and she'll do Q and A. And she said that she would answer as many questions as you have. And so one thing I would encourage you to do as questions come up, don't wait until the end. You can go ahead and put them directly in the chat box. Rachel will be able to see those questions and she can begin to get her thoughts together. Our session flow for today, very simple. We're gonna do video observations of Rachel's instruction. We're gonna pull out some key points and I'm gonna have a few closing thoughts and then we'll go into that Q&A. So our guiding questions for today, for the entire session. The first thing that we're gonna be asking ourselves is what is Rachel doing and why is she doing it? And then as importantly, how do we want to adapt to what she's doing in our own instruction? And this last piece is so very important. How do we foster a sense of community and belonging? These are wild times. They are completely crazy. None of us are prepared. No one is prepared. And least of all, our children are prepared. And so, you know, our children have been taken out of our classrooms, out of seeing their friends every day, out of seeing us every day. And that's um, just a really terrible experience. And so we have to do all that we can to foster that sense of community and belonging so that teaching across a screen really does become a classroom, just a virtual classroom. So I wanna go over what Rachel will be using today. The majority of the people on the call are um, teachers at schools using lifelong readers, so you're gonna have access. If you're using a different curricula, just go ahead and plug that in um, to the different pieces that you'll see today. But the structure will be replicable and the best practices will be replicable. So every time Rachel sits down to teach, she has her guided reading reference book. She's mostly in her structure tab, but does go to her word solving tab and comp tab. She uses free Zoom and the same link every day, so it makes it easy for parents. She uses books from the Lifelong Readers curriculum that are reading A to Z books. She likes to go right onto their site because then she can project the book. And then we've been talking, you know, a number of principals have reached out to me and say, hey, our, you know, our teachers don't have all their oral drill cards or they don't have their vocabulary cards. You know, do you have any suggestions? And so Gibran and I took the time to put all of that digitally on the online platform. And that'll be available this Sunday. We're gonna say by midnight, because we've had some technical difficulties. But Sunday at midnight, you'll have digital copies of everything. You'll be able to log on to the platform, share your screen, and then do the oral drill that way. Now in the videos, you're gonna see how Rachel does that. And the nice thing, Rachel and I have talked, she had done it in the beginning with the physical cards and she's found that it's way more engaging and actually much faster to use the, the, uh, to use the digital version, okay? 
So quick note on management. Here's the real note on management. You can't manage through a screen. It's just not possible. We are not physically in the same space of our students and we just don't have all the tools that we normally have. And so what are our recommendations? The first is that it has to be engaging and it has to be fun. Our students, we want them to want to log on, right? We want them to look forward to it and tell their parents, hey, it's my time up with Miss Shin, Miss Everett, whoever it is. And your pacing really, really matters. And so in the classroom, you're able to do a bit more wait time if a student is struggling. Through a screen, if you're giving 10 seconds or 15 seconds, which is great practice, you start to lose the other kids. And so our pace picks up and we might give a bit of think time, but then when a student struggles, we're going to go to another student or we're going to prompt them faster than we would in the classroom. Mute and unmute. This is a lesson that Rachel and I learned and Megan and Murphy and I in Indianapolis learned. You have to mute and unmute kids. Kids are going to come to you in all different um, settings, right? There might be five other kids in the same room or, you know, there might be a TV on in the background. And so it's really going to be key to mute and unmute kids. And so mostly when you're going to have a group response, it's going to be muted. And then when you want individual responses, that's where you unmute one child at a time. And that's going to keep your lesson a lot tighter and kids a lot more focused. OK, occasionally, Rachel and I kind of joke about this, but occasionally, you know, literally a child might do a handstand during the lesson. Right. Or bring their whole Legos kit and, you know, be putting something together while you teach. And that's, that's, you know, that is what it is, but it's super distracting for the other kids because the kids can see each other. And so occasionally we just turn their camera off, you know, something like, okay, sweetheart, go put your Legos away. I'm going to check back in two minutes. Boom, their camera goes off. Boom, you check them again. They still have their Legos. You say, okay, sweetheart, just listen. I'm going to turn your camera off. And then we speak to, you know, the family afterwards and say, hey, can we change that a little bit? But you can't be trying to manage through a screen. It's, it's zero fun and it's not effective. Okay, so now we dive right in. So the first thing that we're going to do is we are going to see Rachel set expectations for her virtual classroom. Now, I really don't like the terminology set expectations. That's just not really as an educator, not, not, I just couldn't think of another way to put it. So I want to say though, it's very calm. It's very relaxed. It's very casual and it's not sort of this rigid kind of expectations that maybe we're used to when we hear that word. So I wanted to preface that. Okay. So here are our guiding questions. What's Rachel doing and why? What do we want to adapt and how? And then how is she fostering a sense of community and belonging? And before I show the clip, I'll say a lot of fun things are happening here. This group is having hat day, so you'll see that. And one of the students has also figured out on Zoom by himself how to give himself different backgrounds. So right now he has a solar system behind him. So lots of fun things there. But the guiding questions, just jot down your notes and then we'll come back together. right now we're gonna do oh hi guys love your hats for hat day <laughs> love your hats. I have one too looks great Evelyn I love it Alex I love it okay we can take a picture all together with our hats later but right now let's go ahead and get into you can keep your hat Okay, not sure what happened because we might have to watch this again, but the volume wasn't showing on my screen. Can we just have people just put into the chat yes or no whether your volume uh, worked there? Okay, yes, 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 yes. Okay, fantastic. So it is on my end. I'm taking you right back into it. Sorry about that.
and two. You can keep your hats on. That's fine. Okay, let's do one more check right now. So can I have everybody's face in the screen? Put your face close to the screen so that it takes up all of your screen. Good. I can see Nikolai's face and mouth. It's more important that I see your mouth. Good. I see a uh, good Aaliyah. Okay, great. Remember when um, thumbs up next to your face to show me that you're ready. Thumbs up next to your face. Good, show me that you're ready. Good, Kyle. Good, Alex. Good, Riley. And then when you whisper read, how do you whisper read? Show me. Turtle up, turtle shell. Whisper to your turtle. Whisper to your turtle, good. Say something really quiet so I can't hear you. Good. <laughs> okay, and then the last thing is if your friend has a turn but you don't, you're still going to move your mouth so I know that you're doing the work. Sounds good? Sounds great. Sounds great. Okay, give me a thumbs up again next to your face to show me that you're ready. Okay, bringing us back together here. Um, great. So you've jotted down your own ideas as well. So, you know, this I learned from Rachel right away. She does this at the beginning of every single group. And in some of those uh, groups, it's time, it's uh, lesson 10, lesson 11, lesson 12. She does it every single time. And so, of course, she did it face in the screen, nonverbal signals, whisper reading. She even had them practice. And then this idea that everybody does the work. And the nice thing is we'll get to see in some of her later videos. She sets this up. It's always a minute or less. And then she refers back to it, back to it, back to it. And she's going to talk to you at the end about her first lessons. But she'll tell you in her first lessons, she didn't try to get through a bunch of the material. She spent a day talking about the expectations or one day um, on this part of the lesson. But we'll hear that from her a bit later. The thing that I like about the expectations, too, is she makes it really engaging. Each kid gets their own chance to whisper and she's making it really clear like this. OK. And so even as I was working with older kids this week, I did the face in the screen and that helped a lot. We got our nonverbal signals down for our discussion and just previewing that is it just saves time later. And then, of course, this this community, the the hat day, I just think that's brilliant. Um, I know uh, she and others have done pajama day or superhero day or, you know, all these different things. And it's just fostering that sense of belonging and community, even though it's a virtual classroom. OK, so now let's actually go into the lesson. So we're going to see her oral drill. And we're not going to see one complete oral drill. We have montage seven clips together so that we can see a bunch of different phonics components. And the this montage goes across all three groups that she has. OK, again, same questions. What's she doing? Why? Um, how do we want to adapt it for our classroom? And then how do we foster that sense of community and belonging? The vowels are A E I O U. Here we go. A apple, a e egg, a i ig, a o ox, a u up, a. Good. Let's do some individual turns. Listen for your name. Izzy, go. A apple, a e egg, a. I it is. What is? All right, here we go. Aaliyah, you're gonna go first. Aaliyah, the word is. Let's see the word. About. Everybody else's mouth should be moving right now. Don't forget, even if you're not talking, it's Aaliyah's turn. You're still moving your mouth, so I know. About. Down. Good. Where? Good, Alex. Down. That word was there. Say it again, honey. There. There. Good. Everyone say it. There. Good. Other. Good. How. 
how we're going to do it one more time starting from the start this time everybody is muted and everyone is speaking at the same time okay make sure your mouth is moving so let's get close to our screens again show me your faces close to the screen good job make sure that i can see your mouth thumbs up when you're ready here we go sight word list three here we go the word is good down were So everybody is doing these together. Here we go. Word families are words that have the same sound at the end. Riley and Nikolai and Kyle, you're going to join us for this round. All right, here we go. Word families to O-U-L-D says? Ud. Ud, good. If this says Ud, this is? Ud. And this is? Ud. Great. Good. Good. I G H T says I. I. Good. I G H T says I. Here we go. Light. There's no L there, so this word is. Bite. Bite. Good. Next word is. Light. And if that's light, this is. When we put two letters together, it can make a new sound. Two letters together make a new sound. Sound combination. Here we go. Get ready. Everybody. A -Y. Yes, good. Here we go. A Y play. A A C H ch. Keep going. E A read. E. That with me. Good. Say it with me. E E feet. E. Malachi, could you put your face closer to the screen so I can see your mouth? Good. Oh, you house ow. Oh, good, Nicholas. Good. Okay, let's do some individual turns, okay? Listen for your name. Listen for your name. Here we go. Name. Nicholas, go. W A with a W. Malachi, go. D T H D D. Abraham, go. S H S H. Abraham, go. O W B O. Here's what we're going to do for silent E. If it has the silent E at the end, you're going to show a thumbs up. If it doesn't have a silent E at the end, you're going to show a thumbs down to show that we're moving right away. Okay, okay let's go ahead. Does this word, is this a silent E rule? Yes. Aaliyah, this word is? Teeth. Good. This E makes this E say? E, everyone sound out. Get ready. Kyle, go. E, b, the word is T. Great job, Aaliyah. Here we go. Next word. Good, Riley. Put it next to your face so I can see. This does not have the silent E rule. Here we go. Riley, since you did it first. Riley, what's this word? Tall. Tall. Good job sounding it out. This word is? This word is tall. Good. Okay, look for the next one. Here we go. We're going to go individual turns. Listen for your name. Here we go. This word, Amina, what is this word? Amina, is it a short? Everybody show me. Is it a short word or is it a long word? Short. Okay, good. So Y says? Hi. Go ahead, Amina. Uh, fly. Great job. Okay, good. Good, Amina. We're going to move on. Next word is, okay, ready, Gracie? What is this word? What is it? Jerry. Good, Gracie. And this was a long word. So Y says, E. Everybody show me that long word. E. e. Exactly. And Gracie said, jury. Great job, Gracie. Give me a high five for the screen. Okay, bringing us back together, I'm going to share out some things, and then we had a few questions that I can answer right now. Um, the biggest thing that Rachel is doing is she's keeping it unpredictable. And so it's a basic thing that she's doing. She's doing whole group responses, 
subgroup responses, and individual responses. But every time she does it, she does something new. And so while they have the structure of the oral drill, they don't know if they're going to get called on to go first, if the whole group's going to go, if two kids are going to go. And Rachel has spoken to me a lot about that unpredictability, and she thinks that's a huge piece of the student's engagement. And so I wanted to just kind of highlight a few different things. So when she did the first one, the short vowels, she did whole group everybody together. She just had them muted. And then she did individual turns. And in that case, in her individual turn, that was a lower ability group. So she let each child do A-E-I-O-U. She wanted vowels are so important. This is a group that struggles. Let me get every single child. And it happened very fast. Um, then when she did her sight words, she decided to go individual turns first. And so she had a few kids do a word, moved, da, 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 and then she ended with the whole group said them all on mute. And she was making sure their mouths were moving. And then with word families, she did something uh, different again. She said, I want everybody to do it, but Kyle's joining us, Alex is joining us, and Amina is joining us. And so everybody had to say it, but three kids um, were not muted so that she could actually listen in there. And then again, for the rules, she did something completely different for the silent E. She's doing this for this, for this. And so again, the structure, the routine is familiar, but how she is facilitating it is keeping kids on their toes and keeping them engaged. And the way that, uh, actually had, I had a question and then I had a comment. So, uh, Castenzio, who is, I believe you're in Milwaukee right now, he was pointing out that literally kids are all doing the work. That was, it was like how, you know, this is a virtual situation. These kids are all five and she's checking their mouths moving the way she's facilitating. Really, everybody's doing everything. And exactly. And that's incredible. And I wanted to add on to what Castenzio is saying by Rachel going back and forth between whole group and individual turn, she's also monitoring them, right? It, this isn't solely engagement, engagement matters. But at the same time, we have to make sure that they're engaged in the content in the correct way, right? Otherwise that's a waste of time. And so while that's an engagement technique, it's a management technique, it's keeping her going fast, it's keeping kids on their toes. She's also just constantly checking for understanding through those individual and subgroup um, terms. And there was a question that I can take right now. This is from Cassie from Memphis Delta Prep. So Cassie's just saying, I assume we're still doing our, our, our curriculum, we're still doing the same oral drills, and that we're just doing those oral drills for the levels that the kids are on. Exactly, Cassie, that's exactly what we're doing. Now, we can talk about this at the end. You're probably going to have some mixed leveled groups, and so then we have to kind of go across two oral drills and see, you know, what is most valuable for that set. But generally, yes. Yes, we're still following the structure um, guide and we're still hitting those components at a specific level. OK, um, and then I just want to say that the, the community and the belonging. Rachel is constantly affirming her kids and she's constantly laughing with her kids. I have watched many, many, many of her full lessons with all of her groups and the kids are happy and the kids are laughing and they feel that affirmation. And so that piece of how our kids feel about themselves as learners matters just as much as how much they learn. I'll, I know I'm repeating myself from, from summer training, but uh, I love Sally Shaywitz. So Sally Shaywitz is the director of the Center for uh, Dyslexia and Creativity at Yale. And she did um, a longitudinal study with kids who were in kindergarten and just said, how do you feel about yourself as a learner? Do you think you're smart? And if they said yes, that answer was far more important than their actual ability. And the kids who knew a lot and said no, when you compared them long term, kids who said yes, who thought they were good learners, they're the ones who did better. And so self-concept, self-esteem, that relationship is just as important as the content, if not more important. OK, a question. It is somebody asked. It's not silly at all. Um, my camera is can be in the way during the um, during the videos and you can't see the kids. So if you just go to my camera on the bottom right, there's a dotted box with um, an arrow. And if you hit that, it'll kind of dock mine over here and then you'll be able to see all the kids. OK.
Okay, great. Now we are ready for the during reading, which is just going to be the storybook reading. Same exact questions. What's Rachel doing? I would say really, really pay attention to how she facilitates this. This is the first thing she sent me. She said, hey, early, early on, she said, hey, can you watch this guide a reading lesson? And this was the lesson that she had me watch. And when, when I saw this, I was like, oh, this is brilliant. She is actually um, completely translating classroom practices into a virtual classroom in a way that I didn't know was possible. And so really pay attention to how she structures this and then whatever you want to adapt and then keep thinking about the community and the belonging as well. So this next book is called Dr. Jen. This is a story about Dr. Jen. Mm -hmm. It's a story about a family that gets sick and has to go see their doctor. So I'm going to show you the title of this book. And there is a picture of the doctor on the front cover. When you see the doctor, give me a thumbs up. There's Dr. Jen. OK, great. So are you ready to read? Okay, so here's yeah. really important today. I'm not gonna mute you guys, but I need you to make sure that you're really whispering. So can we practice that right now? If that means you have to put your turtle up and whisper, or you whisper really quiet. Riley, can you practice whispering right now? Whisper. Yeah, good. Nikolai, practice your whisper. Good. Kyle, practice your whisper. Good, good. Evelyn, practice your whisper so that no one else can hear you. Alex, practice your whisper. Okay, good, Alex. And Aaliyah, practice your whisper too. Okay, here we go. So I don't want to hear anybody speaking yet until we get to our, until we get to your turn and individual turns. Are we ready? Okay, mm -hmm. here we go. Dr. Jen, and let's see what this family that gets sick does when they have to go see the doctor. Okay, whisper read to yourself the first page. Go ahead. Okay, Riley, you're up first. Riley, can you read for us, please? Let me get my, my highlighter ready. Okay, go ahead. My chunk it. Who can help out Riley with this word? Um, e -R -P -R. Yes, we saw E R. So now Riley, put sound out. If we know that this part is E-R-R, -er, what's this? Sister. If it's a family member, who do you think it would be? In the sister. Family? Sister, yep. Um, My sister, keep reading, Riley. My sister is sick. She has a fever. Good. Let's, Let's take her to Dr. Jen. Beautiful. Whisper read to yourself now. If it's every single family member, think about what makes sense here. Keep going. Good. Kyle, you're up next. Go ahead and read for us, please. My brother is sick. My Temperature. Not temperature. You're very, I like how you were thinking about temperature and the doctor, but take a look at their, take a look at what they're doing in the picture. Um, Good. And then Kyle, what rule do you see here? This is Kyle's turn, so don't take it. Tummy. A. Okay, does that make sense though, Kyle? H, does that make sense? What could go there that makes sense, you guys? Raise your hand if you think you know. My brother is sick. He has a tummy H. Does that make sense? No. What could no. Be? no. Tummy H. Tummy H. Good, let's keep reading. Okay, next page, whisper read. Oh boy. 
Sister got sick, brother got sick. Who's next? Hi. Hi. Good, Nicola, catching yourself and going whisper. Okay, Evelyn, your turn. Here we go, Av. My. Av. Uh, uh, so uh, what family member is that? Who is this? Father. Father. Father is sick. She has a cough. Good, cough. Let's. Let's, yep. Take him to Dr. Jen. Pick up your finger right now, everybody, and I want you to put your finger on the words that we know and it's a pattern every single time. There is one sentence that we see every single time. Put your finger on the pattern right now. Good. What's the pattern, Alex? Dr. Jen. Yeah, let's, let's take him to Dr. Jen is what they say over and over again. So should we be word solving that last sentence? Yes or no? No. No, no, no. Okay, let's keep reading. Whisper, read to yourself quickly. Okay, Alex, read for us, please. My mom is... It could be mom, but babe, I see some combinations mother. here. Mother, good. The her. Keep going. Mother. My mother is... Yo. I'm... Does I'll make sense or does ill make sense? Ill. Ill. Ill is another word for I'm sick. So ill is a different word for sick. Okay, keep going, Alex. My mother is ill. She has a sore. Sore. Or C H D. Good. So Alex, what could be that? What could this be? She has a sore throat. What is that called when this hurts? You have a sore what? The throat doesn't make sense. What do people say when you're when 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 inside of your neck hurts? What do you say? I have a sore th. What is that? Throat. 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 Could this word be throat? Look at the word again. Put your finger on the word. Everybody sounds it out. Th oh, oh. oh a boat. Oh. Okay. Could this be throat? Yes. Yes. When I read that to myself, I have to ask, does it make sense? Yeah, because sore throat doesn't make sense. Sore throat does. Good. Alex finished the last sentence. Okay, bringing us back together, there are a lot of really good comments I'm gonna get to. But for me, when I saw Rachel do this, I didn't know, I didn't actually know if we would be able to mimic classroom guided reading into virtual guided reading with the littlest kids. And so when I saw her do this, she brings up again a lifelong reader's text on reading A to Z. You could use another program too. And then she's constantly marking it up, right? And it's actually mimicking it exactly. What do we ask kids to do in guided reading? We ask them to read in a whisper voice first. And as they li listen, as I'm sorry, as they whisper, read, we go around and listen, they read out loud for us and we prompt them. She has now just set up, everybody gets the whisper read every single time. And then that kid that reads out loud, of course, does to the whole group. Typically it's just us, um, reads to the whole group. And then she does her word solving prompting from there. And I think I was, <laughs> um, I really like Vox uh, documentaries, mini documentaries, videos. I don't know if you guys do, but I'm always noticing how Vox keeps you interested when maybe something's not so interesting. So they take like a dense piece of paper, but if they're going to read it, they highlight it in yellow so that you can kind of read it too. And as I was watching Rachel mark up a book, it actually reminded me of Vox documentaries. And so 
that alone, really getting a pin out, really having that, it pulls everybody in. And rather than just kind of staring off while your friend gets prompted, that's there. And then Brenna pointed out, Brenna, I know you're in Wisconsin. I don't know if you are in Milwaukee or Racine, but Brenna pointed out like, wow, all the, um, the peer word solving that it's not just that kid. When that kid gets to read, it's not just that child's turn, it's everybody's turn. And so that's what Brennan was particularly impressed with, that while it might be Kyle's turn, Evelyn still gets to prompt Kyle basically, or help him out. And so I think that's part of it too. You have to also keep it unpredictable. Sometimes she's gonna go to the child who's reading. Sometimes she'll say, hey, anybody in the group know? Sometimes she'll go to a specific child. So that was great. There was something else that I wanted to point out. Let me see if I can find this. Good. So this is from Shelby in Brooklyn. And she says that she loves that kids are first reading in a whisper voice so that every single kid gets that practice and then they all get the out loud practice. Um, she's adding a technique, which I really like. So the other day she tried out, she has kindergartners as well that if their friend makes a mistake when they read out loud and they know the word, they can put a thumb up and then Shelby can quickly see her group. She can call on a student to help that student out. What a great technique. And it's also a technique, it's a check for understanding or a check for attention, whichever one it is, right? If you have a child, you know they could read the word, they don't put their thumb up, then you know they're not really paying attention. Um, but a child that might struggle, that doesn't put their thumb up, you know they don't know it, right? So I thought that was a really great um, technique. People really liked that. I, I liked it too, I like stopped it and I showed uh, my partner Gibran, I said, look at this part. And it's when she said, what's the part that keeps repeating? Everybody touched the part and everybody touched it on their screen. And then she said, we're not going to word solve the pattern. You know, these are kids working on a level EF or a step four. They shouldn't have to word solve the pattern. And that was a great interactive moment as well. There were also other people pointing out, especially people who work with this level specifically, that she is teaching into this level hard. So she is, this is step four level E, F. Um, she's all over the whisper because this is the first le um, level where you have to whisper. So you're on the silent reading trajectory starting at this level. So she's all over that. Um, she's all over using meaning, which is the word solving strategy that we introduce at this level. And then she's really picking up on sound combinations because sound combinations one is the first time it comes up on level E F step four. So while doing a bunch of amazing things, she's also targeting her instruction to what these kids need. Um, Carice from Henderson said, hey, do you have good data um, data techniques? I'm sorry, data collecting techniques. We do. The majority that we have created are for grades one and above. And so what I'll be, uh, we'll share that tomorrow during that webinar. And then I would say in the Q&A though, feel free to ask Rachel. I know that Rachel keeps a lot in her head um, because she's in her 10th year of teaching because she has a lot of experiences and very strong, but she can tell you anything that she also writes down. Fantastic. Um, here we go. Let's go ahead into the last video clip. So here is what Rachel and I, we've experimented both ways. And I think we are now agreeing that levels A to F pre to four, if you're going to do virtual guided reading, just go with the inference question that the retail is quite hard to facilitate um over a screen that kids are they're losing attention it's hard to keep everybody together but as we've experimented with the inference question the inference question you can get everybody on the same question and everybody's going to get a chance to answer the question they're going to get their thoughts um out there and then one thing that rachel and i have really been working on with all of our groups whether they're in third or fourth grade or they're five years old is vocabulary and that we are pushing them to use vocabulary words in their inferences so what we're going to see is uh, Rachel's after reading. And in her after reading, she's doing a quick vocab reminder lesson. And then she's going into her inference question. So be thinking again about how we want to adapt things and then also um, the community and the belonging. I'm going to add one more thing. Her sequence is really logical and I think um, is really replicable for all of us. So I would also just kind of jot down what does she do with the kids as she does this vocabulary inference. Okay, great. 
So this word is the word disappointed. Can you say it one time? Disappointed. Say it. Disappointed. Good, Kyle. Say it. Disappointed. Say it again. Good, Ali, a little louder for me. Okay, guys. So this word, Evelyn, can you say disappointed? Disappointed. Good. Okay, so disappointed means when you hoped something would happen, but it didn't happen. You were let down a little bit. You hoped something would happen, but then it didn't happen. Okay, so we're going to think right now, who is disappointed in the story? And if you use this word, I am going to pull the card up and do a crazy little dance with my card. Okay, and we're going to use also the word excited. We're also going to use the word excited. Let me see if I can pull that up for you right now. Bum, bum, bum. If you know what the word excited means, just do this. Yeah, a lot of you already know what the word excited means. It means when you are really happy about something that is happening. Why do you think that the class, why does the class think Kat and Kate's idea is great? And so what one thing we're going to do really quickly is Mrs. Shin's going to go ahead and turn the pages. And when I get to the page that you are like, yeah, that's the page where my evidence is on, I'm going to have you put up a stop sign like this. Practice stop sign. Put it down. Practice stop sign. You got to put it up really fast and you have to put it up in front of your screen so I can see. Yes. Do it one more time. Okay. Back. All right, here we go. So where's the page that, where's the page that we need to be thinking about that has our answer? Why are, why does the class think that Kat and Kate's idea is great? Is it this page? Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Watch my screen. Oh, seeing stop signs, good. Okay, so here are my two pages. Everybody go back and reread these pages to yourself. And if you have the answer, Raise your hand. If you know why the class thinks it's a great idea, raise your hand. Love it. Kyle, start us off. They think that Kate and Kat's idea is great because, uh, they're excited. Because what? Because maybe they're excited. Tell me more. Because maybe they're excited um, to feed the fish. What do you guys think? Alex wants to build. Evelyn, is it a disagree, Evelyn? Nikolai wants to build. Okay, Alex, let's hear from you. Alex, what do you think? I agree with Kyle, but I won't build on. Go ahead. The kids think it's a good idea because they could take turns. Riley? I agree with Alex. Say why, say more. Let's use this word right now. Disappointed. The kids are not disappointed anymore. Why were they disappointed? Because everyone wanted to feed Fred. Everybody wanted to feed Fred. But now, Nikolai. They're sharing. And what word best describes it? They're the taking word? turns. They're taking turns. So are they disappointed or are they excited? Excited. Excited. Okay. Evelyn, or I'm sorry, um, Aaliyah, tell me why. They're excited because they get to because they get to take the fish with them. They get to all take turns. I love that. Pick your finger up right now. Pick your finger up right now and show me exactly where that evidence is that you're telling me about. Go back to the book right now and point to the evidence of which one you think is why the kids think it's a great idea. Okay, Alex, do you have the evidence? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, take a turn. Yes, Alex. I like how you went right to that part. Everybody look at that evidence. Put your finger on what I highlighted. 
Each of you can take a turn. Ooh, I maybe had that a little bit more. Each of you can take a turn, Kat said. What do you think about that evidence? Does that prove what, what you just said about why the kids are not disappointed anymore and why they are excited? Good, you guys. That was awesome. Okay, so many amazing things happening there. There's just a lot. Um, and the the comment bar that Rachel and I can see is like blowing up with like, oh my gosh, the habits of discussion or the accountable talk or the just like how the kids are speaking to each other. Um, they're five. And then what's doubly amazing is they're all English language learners. Okay, and so Rachel has very over and over has taught them those starters, how to speak to each other. Um, but that was a really fantastic five minutes and that's what it was five minutes and the sequence that I got down was that I got down that Rachel started with the vocab so she you know she gave a little vocab how she was going to do it it took her one minute to go through those vocab words they they knew excited they hadn't seen disappointed and then from there and she said I want you to try and use these in your question right and then from there she went into the question um, she gave a good amount of think time and then after she had given the think time and people had their answer, then she did what to me was the brilliant evidence move. So she and I, she, so her, her method was, I'm going to flip through the pages and you have to put a stop sign up when you see evidence. She and I, we were figuring out how to do this. And I said, I guess we're just going to have to go to the page and then they're going to have to find the evidence on the page. And Rachel's like, no, 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 we'll just teach them the stop sign. And I'm like, oh, that's a lot smarter. Um, so we have vocab intro, question, think time, evidence stop sign, and then kids put the stop sign out and she allowed for answers. And as she was allowing for the answers, every single child got to say what they think to keep the conversation, pushing it to a, a level that was deeper. She brought out the opposite word for, for the child to use the opposite word. Um, and then they reread that page and had to literally put their finger on the evidence. That's the sequence I got more or less and you'll have access after. So that to me was a brilliant, brilliant five minutes. And you know, I think sometimes we worry um, that our kids aren't getting maybe enough comprehension time when they're learning to read. If they get that five minutes, what Rachel did was five minutes every single day that we have them with us, that's all the comprehension they need. Um, and it's going to push them where they need to go. And then we're able to spend the majority of our lesson in the before and the during because these kids, what's most important is that they are learning to read at this stage. I wanted to pull out a few more um, comments. There were lots of people were loving the vocab, the way um, that Rachel was doing the vocab. Um, Jenny from Denver was asking, are we going to have for the lifelong reader schools, will we have access to that? Yes. All that's going to be on the distance learning icon this Sunday at midnight for our lifelong reader schools. And you will log on, you'll share your screen if you use Zoom or whatever you use, and then you'll be able to click through all the PowerPoints and you'll see everything there with your students. I think there was another question. People are loving the vocab. Um, prompting and facilitation of the discussion is seamless. It mirrors the classroom almost exactly from Shanice. And then, yeah, the super affirming, super affirming. Um, yep. And then somebody pointed out that I think she got to every single child. Um, the other thing I want to say is what I think Rachel is a master of. Rachel has taught as high as fourth grade. Um, she spent years in fourth grade. And so now she's back in kindergarten. But she uses a lot of those same techniques. Kyle, the first one, gave a wonderful answer. And then Alex built on and gave an awesome answer. And then I think from there, Nikolai built on and said something fantastic. And the whole time she's, you know, she's affirming them to participate but she didn't affirm their answer until the very last minute. And that's when she told them they did an awesome job. And so I think that's really important too, that kids have to be able to give their answer. And then we have to back up so that other kids can evaluate and, and um, figure out what they think. Okay, so I'm gonna move us forward. We are about to close out and go into our question and answer. Yeah, so some closing closing thoughts. Um, the first clo 
closing thought is about community. Um, many of you know that Gibran and I have spent the last year and a half visiting schools in different parts of the world. And we've seen some incredible schools. We've seen incredible schools in China and Finland and some of these countries that are just outperforming everybody else. But I think one of my favorites was to Colombia, to the capital, Bogota. And for better or worse, mostly worse, they rank their public schools one through 292. And we had a chance to visit the number one school. And it was a low income school, which was very unusual. All the other schools in the top tier were in very wealthy communities. And so I said to the principal, I said, this is probably an impossible question to ask you. But if you had to narrow it down to one thing to say why you guys have a number one rating, what is it? And she just didn't miss a beat. She said, it's absolutely not impossible. And I can tell you with certainty what it is. And she said, it's community engagement. She said, there is no wall between this school and the community and the community is inside the school and the school is out into the community. And they did some amazing things that cause zero money. Grandparents are invited one time a week with every grandchild they have to take a class. The day that we were there, the middle schoolers were like dancing salsa with their grandparents. You know, they just do tons of things like that. But I was thinking about that. This is actually the time that we need community more than ever and that many of us and that many of our students don't have access to that full community, that love, that support. And as weird as this might sound, we actually might get a chance to know our students' families better now than we ever could in the past. Every time they log on, there's the parent, we're communicating far more. And so I would just encourage all of us to really think about community and belonging and how we can use especially the the um, the live interactions to get to know our students better, to get to know their families better. Something that Rachel does, she spends the first couple of minutes and all kids get to say hi to each other. At the end, they all get to say hi to each other. And that's also part of the reason her kids want to come is because they get to see the other kids in their class. And so I just want that to be on our minds. And then, because this is Lifelong Readers, I want to make quick book recommendations. I think books are a wonderful escape from the world, especially fiction, and we, we all need a bit of a, an escape. And then I also think that books make us better people. I firmly believe that. So if you don't have a lot of time, young adult books are always a good way to go. And... Um, some people know, some people don't. So Lois Lowry, you know, she wrote The Giver. And then like five later, five years later, she wrote Gathering Blue. And then five years later, Messenger. And then like 10 years later, Sun. And she calls this a quartet, which is the first time I'd ever heard that. But you basically have four dystopian worlds, just like you did in the first one. And all your questions get to be answered by the end, but not in any sort of linear way. And I would give uh, the giver quartet, like the same rating as I give Harry Potter, which is the highest rating I give. And I just discovered this author and I think she is absolutely incredible. I just finished the first book on the left, 10 minutes, 38 seconds in this strange world. Mm -hmm. And I just started The Architect's Apprentice on the right and I think they're incredible. So I wanted to make those recommendations. And then the last thing before I'm gonna bring Rachel on, is around resources and staying connected. We are going to try to send out regular emails, no more than one a week, um, when we have videos and new resources and new webinars. If you want to be on that list, you just go to our website and when you click out of this webinar, it's gonna go directly to that website, uh, lifelongreaders.us. You go to the bottom, which is the contact area. You put your first name, last name in the comment, just put distance learning and we'll know that you want to join that email list for new resources and videos uh, for our lifelong readers. Schools, the distance learning uh, icon will be up Sunday at midnight. You'll have digital access to everything you had physically with the cards. And tomorrow is going to be our grades one and two uh, virtual guided reading webinar. And I'm going to send out the invite for grades three, four, and five today. Great. And for folks who don't have lifelong readers, um, if you put your name into the contact, I'll make sure you get all the videos from today as far as and the webinar from today. And then lifelong readers, that'll all be on our portal. And then it'll also be on our YouTube channel. Okay. 
All right, fantastic. So now Q and A with Rachel. Um, and I wanna say, I guess the last thing is timing, it just depends. You need anywhere from at least 25 minutes up to an hour, but you know, everybody's doing different things and you're not gonna get through as much as you would in the classroom, but Rachel can speak specifically to these levels. So let's bring Rachel on. Rachel, let's see if you can do it on your end with your camera or if I have to do it. Let me see. Presenters. There's Rachel. Okay, fantastic. Let me get us here. Okay. Okay, Rachel, say hi to everybody. Hello. Thank you for all the nice comments. It's really encouraging. Thank you. I appreciate it. That's awesome. We are so thankful to Rachel. She got all of this going. This was the very first one and then everything stems from her work. So Rachel, we're so, we're so thankful. Um, okay. Let me see, Rachel, I'm going to start going through the comments. I know I saw one from Sarah at Memphis that I'm going to start you with. She has a timing question. She wants to know about how long your groups are and what you can get to during that time. Yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, this is this is week three. We just rounded out week three. So some of the video footage that you just saw came from yesterday. So it's all super fresh. Um, and, oh, sound is delayed. Oh. Maybe you can mute them. Let me see, let me see. Wait a minute. So, off of yours. Wait, let me see here. What are people saying really quickly? Okay. Um, sound is delayed. Can everybody just quick go ahead and do a yes, no? Could you hear what Rachel said? Okay. The majority are yes. If you're a no, go ahead and email Jabron and he'll help you out. Okay. Rachel, great. Just go ahead and take it from there. Okay. I think there's an echo, Emily, because of me. Oh, yeah. Let me, take this back. Let me turn mine off. Okay, great. Well, yeah. Um, this is, I'm slow. Um, yeah, I think you're off. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, in terms of timing, it was really interesting. Like everything takes double the time, right? So it's just taking a long time for us to, um, to go through something that we would in the normal. Oh, good, Molly. Um, so in a normal classroom, um, a would it like the oral drill takes minutes like three to five minutes max and we're noticing that until you get the groove of things it's taking a really it takes a long time like two times i would say um about for each kind of practice to go through so it really depends on how you want to get kind of start that groove so on friday it was like the very first time we had ever met it was a friday and we had just it was more for parents to make sure that they were on Technical difficulties weren't there before we started instruction. And then even on that day, I just kind of played around with what would it look like? And, and that's when we figured out things about like the microphone. Oh, it's horrible if they're all on and doing oral drill at the same time. So you'll you'll kind of, um, you'll get the flow of it yourself as you go through. And what happens a lot is I'll prioritize one or two things, really thinking about like what are the main buckets that we're struggling with. So for example, if I know that there is like a why, like for example, in kindergarten, there was a why rule in that, um, in the most recent book that we read today, and it showed up like seven times. So I was like, okay, we have to do why rule before we start today. Otherwise, if that's not solidified, then we're going to have problems during our reading. Um, so it's things like that, just kind of prioritizing, right? And then also same thing as you do, like trust your gut, trust your instinct with Emily's curriculum, just going through and knowing like, for some groups, I don't do the consonant sounds anymore. For some groups, I don't do this anymore. You're just constantly switching in and out based on the data that's coming through. So it could be right now we're doing three 20 minute groups. We might move them or 25 minute groups and, you know, buffer zone of like two minutes in the beginning, two, three minutes at the end. We like to do like a lot of like rewards and incentives. So we use class dojo. So it's like, they love like when they come in, they get points. And when they leave, thank you for doing blah, blah, blah. Like you did great. And then they get points on their way out. And that kind of just like transitions between the, the next group that's coming in. So just um, 
you know, just be gentle with yourself and it's okay. It's not, it, it, I think if you're comparing yourself to classroom you versus virtual classroom you, you're gonna be disappointed. And I think you still have a structure in mind and you are just thankful for anything that happens during that, <laughs> during that block of time. So I would say anywhere from, and the reason why we do 20 minutes is for K, right? So in, in a real classroom setting, we're doing 20 minutes, 25 minute groups and um, their their attention span is just not as long. So we've cut down to about maybe 20 minutes of active time. And then um, if you're in upper grades, like fourth grade, fifth grade and beyond, like I, I can imagine that they can sit for longer periods of time. But at the same time, they're also, um, they're also doing a lot more heavy work. So maybe not, maybe not longer than that, right? So the virtual world is very different from being in a person to person space. So just kind of keep that um, on the top of mind and just be really generous with yourself. Rachel, that's great. Be really generous with yourself. That's really good. Um, okay, so I'm gonna give you the next questions that come up and then I'll keep, uh, I'll keep moderating them. So you have first, you have from Mary. She says, okay, this is great, um, wonderful, but this is a little bit older than what she teaches and she wants to know how do you, and you have this group, but she said, how do you do your pre two group? And for people who don't use that, um, it's, it's levels A and B in Fontes and Pinnell. And so if you'll start with that, and then um, Susan from Chicago would like to know, and I can add on to this one too. If you had to do a recorded lesson, let me make sure I get this right. Yeah, what, how would you do this in a recorded format? Okay? Okay, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, so for the, for the first question about structuring for lower grades, I think I'm just pulling up my I'm just pulling up my structure guide. This is just like always with me because I just can't memorize it. Obviously, um, it's a lot about like you can also do a ton of like you know obviously know that you're mirroring you're mirrored just like you are in the classroom, right? Like so, um, if I'm facing the students, you can still do concepts of print. You can still do all of that great stuff like one to one and having um, we use a lot of like sentence strips at times we use whiteboards but also um, zoom calls have they have all that stuff they have whiteboards they have you can type words out like we've been doing a ton of sound out activities where I type one letter at a time and so they'll be like if it's um what a uh, what, bug I'll type the B and they'll go buh, 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 and then I'll say you and they'll go buh. and it's almost like it's actually um, we're Emily and I were talking about this it's actually um, technology is being used in a way that is like more conducive to the learner right whereas like in the classroom we're just so fixed on like oh it's so this is what I've always done this is how I always do it I write it out but they are responding so well to different ways and just be creative with the um with the ways you can use technology I'm also thinking about right like I can have my book out I know that it's hard I know that it's tough, but it's also just like a ton of modeling and you could even like use anything and just say like, how many letters do you see here? And like what we're like, and even getting them engaged, pick up your finger, like point to which one is the letter R, like letter recognition, right? Even like, which way do we read? We read from left to right, just using those um, exact things. And and the big thing I would say for pre to, to pre one is just like slowing down a lot. Like we are slowing down and that group that you saw um, throughout this throughout this PD was um, our highest level group. And we do have an H and M and an L group and the L group just takes, everything takes much longer. So some days I'm just doing oral drill with them and some days we're just reading and some days we're just talking about the book. So really like decide as the same way that you would in the classroom and how you would differentiate and how you would either speed up or slow down for your kids. Um, I would say the exact same thing, but, but then just like parsing through and deciding I, I need to do this today and this is not so much, right? You could even across three days do um, before reading, during reading, after reading. And that's okay to break that up because we know that that's okay for our um, lowest readers always. So if, if, if anything, it's more than that. It's gonna take two to three days to get through a book. Let me, and I'm just gonna add on for a second. Um, some things that I've seen Rachel do. So, and um, we also have more footage and we're gonna keep cutting all of the footage and we're gonna put it between the distance learning icon and YouTube, okay? So anybody who wants access to that, you just get on that email list and you'll have it. So I'm already thinking of a clip right away for that question. Um, Mary's question about pre two AB that I, I know the clip exactly that we can use for that. And the other thing that I just wanted to 
point out that Rachel does with her levels A and B a lot is that she reads the first two pages. They point along and if they know, they mouth it to themselves. And after she's done two pages like that, typically she has them unmuted so that she can actually see, do they know it or not? Then she's able to use her exact same structure she uses with some of the higher kids, which is where she can mute it. Um, but now she knows they're set up for success. Um, so that's a really good technique um, for those younger levels. And we'll get more video of that as well. Um, I'm going to take it back to you, Rachel, for the, the anything that you would recommend pre-recorded. Um, Olivia Cox from North Carolina. I don't know if you're on here. If you're on here, will you text me? Because I know you have a lot of good ideas with that, too. Um, OK, Rachel, giving it back to you now. So in terms of pre-recorded, there's a few ideas here. I think that it's hard to do almost a like, um, like I would suggest breaking things down. Like I know that our school currently is doing a lot of um, YouTube videos. And so we'll do maybe like structured videos that say, here's the oral drill and then having students look back. So they're replicable. If it's like the consonant letters, then just like doing one video that is like short and sweet, that is just consonant sounds. Or if it's doing videos that it's just an oral drill for their particular grade band, it's so easy for parents to help them like press play and they just like watch the deck go through. Um, so that's one idea for in terms of like pre-recording, Susan, and other ways that you can do it. I would just say like pre-recording is like very, um, this is like shout out to Shelby, but she's she's always calling them like these blues clues videos, right? Like, like what do you think? And it's just it's just a little bit different when, and we're, we've been doing those too for math and, and other subjects. So just be careful with those because I noticed that the longer that those videos are, you're just not getting as much viewership because, you know, I can hold on to the attention of like 15, uh, 15 to 20 minutes for a group because I'm constantly, okay, what do you think? Like, what about you? And hey, you know, like come back, come back, come closer to the screen so I can see you. And there's just like real, real life interaction versus a video is harder because then um, it, if anything, it has to be like more engaging. It has to be a lot of like, pa like blah, 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 you say it. Okay, good, you say it. And and kids are also super engaged in those as well, but you just have to make sure that you understand timing. So no longer than I would say, I, I, and I've been trying to pare my videos down because some of them have been like 15 to 17 minutes. And I notice that the ones that are more successful are like six minutes long. So just keep that in mind if that helps. And um, if it's a video, then you can, uh, if it's pre-recorded, you can of course, um, on Zoom call at least, like press press record and do everything like the voiceover and it'll get everything for you. So just keep that in mind if it's just like, it depends on the skill. If you want them just to practice their fluency, then great, like pull up a book and get started right away. Here are the concepts of print, like look left to right, great, how many words do you see? How many letters do you see? Give the answer, give the answer, and then just get started with the reading and, and try to be as, as much like choral response kind of thing as possible, like question, answer, what do you think about that? Oh, press pause, like go find it. And so I would say that's probably the best course to go when it's pre-recorded. Okay, bringing us both on and getting to a few different things. Um, Sarah Cook, thank you for your wonderful message. That was really sweet. And um, I realized I asked Rachel the question about concepts about print. She started to answer it and then your question came in. If we didn't fully answer it, just go ahead and put a, um, any more specific questions and we'll get to it. Um, a lot of questions right now are coming in two things. One is coming in is on progress monitoring. And the second that's coming in is schedule. And the third one coming in that I wanna say while we have everybody here is Megan from, do you, Rachel, you'll know, am I saying it right? Vista Prep, is that right? This, this is how you say it. Okay, I'm not making a decoding error, I hope so. All right, I'm gonna put this, let me see, right here. So we should all publicly have a message together now. Um, there it is. Great. So there's Megan. So she is sharing with us, which is awesome. She's sharing with us all these oral drill videos accessible here. If you have any resource at all you would like to share right now, please, please, please put it in the comment and I'll bring it over to the public. Thank you, Megan. I, that's fantastic. Um, 
Okay, so we got to the Sarah's. So we've got progress monitoring and we've got scheduling. I am going to, I am going to let Rachel um, take it for a second. If Megan Murphy is still on the call, um, please text me because I know you have a lot of ideas and we can bring it up. But I can tell you after working with a lot of different principles, people are kind of going track A or they're going track B. Track A is classroom teacher stays with all their kids. So Rachel right now is on track A. Those are all of her kids that she teaches. She teaches them four times a week and she sees each group for 30 minutes. I'll let her talk all, you know, other things as well. The other track is when you departmentalize. And so what happens is I'm a first grade teacher and I teach a certain, certain levels and I'm gonna teach kids all across the school with those levels. OK, so as you're thinking about that, you got to decide as a school, are we going classroom paced or are we going to departmentalize and people are going to see um, kids from different classes? I'll give you a quick pro and a con. The pro on track A is the teacher knows the kids inside and out. OK, the con is you typically have one time that they can come meet. So on the other side, um, the pro is the child typically it's two or three times per day they can log in. And um, the con is the teacher's not going to know them as well. I am going to push it to Rachel, and then I'm going to see if Megan is available as well. I think that's a great question. I'm going to try to keep my answer short. So in case I don't, you know, I don't like I tend to go over. Um, so I'll keep it short. And then if you feel like it didn't answer, then just go ahead and I'll see the question. I'll see the clarification come through. So basically, um, I, I, yeah, like what Emily said is really important because I have like six to seven months of data that I've been tracking for them, uh, tr tracking my particular students over the course, like since September, Hi, right? Mommy. Hi, baby. Can you come in, no, that's my two-year-old daughter. You may not come in. Um, so, so what Emily said is right in terms of like, I have a lot of data inside of my head in terms of I know them, but it's also because of, um, the tracking that has happened in the past. I notoriously have like a scrap piece of paper and it doesn't matter. I know some people have like really, really formal trackers and some people have checklists of, and, and I don't think it needs to be all of that because you do get to know your, your kids and their personalities, but also their um, personalities as readers. So, you know, I know that Kyle knows everything almost all the time and he will, and, and if I need something, he has my back. I know that Riley has like trouble with a little bit of decoding here and there. I know Alex is our weaker, weaker, weaker learner in the group. And he's kind of been like, during these trial times, he got bumped up to the H group because there was no room, yet, you know? So there's like a lot of things that happen there. But um, I don't see how it's I don't see why it's any different than in the classroom when we have whatever whatever way that whatever strategy or whatever way that you take notes and take data on your children. It's the same. If anything, it's kind of nice because you have the space and time to still do it like you can hear them and simultaneously because you're not having physical books in front of them. Um, you can still do the check in and you can still do that. Like what Emily and I were talking about, it's still the same. It's still individual check ins. It's still whispery to me as I check in, I lean my head towards you. Um, and it's it's very similar to the classroom in terms of like the kids can still hear what they're saying, right? Isn't that the whole idea when you're doing like grouped reading is that they can kind of hear what the other kid is saying and pick up, oh, that must be about, oh, that's this. And um, so yeah, the, I think the, along with um it's really cool i think what shelby was saying earlier we've been trying i've been testing out this like put your hand next to your face because the kids were raising their hand right it's like all troubleshooting they were raising their hand up here i couldn't see it and i was like put your hand next to your face and raise your hand if you can help because kids would be getting stuck and exactly what shelby said they would be like okay um i see er like and i'm like what's the clue and they were like i see a combination and trying just as lifelong readers always says like keeping that funnel prompting in mind like as big as possible and then paring down and I know in the video it was showing a little bit more pared down because that was closer to like our second or third session um, but now it's become a lot more right and even during those moments I'm gathering data on who knows it and who has it and who doesn't right like one of my friends just knows every single prompt um, every time 
and oh, that's the Y rule, that's the, I see these letter combinations. And some kids just are a little slower to see it and that's fine, um, but that's also something to be aware of. But I think it's very, very similar to, um, to classroom setting. Okay, Megan, so Megan Murphy is the principal of Circle City Prep, and I've made her a presenter. So hopefully we'll see her video in a moment, I think, maybe. Let me see, we'll see. Um, but I wanna go ahead and, you know, one thing that Megan has done that's pretty incredible, and she did this when she saw it all coming, but it can be done on the back end as well. Megan really took an incredible um, survey, a need survey of her parents and found out exactly which household didn't have Chromebooks and which households didn't have Wi-Fi. And because she did that so early, there she is. Um, and because she does everything in Spanish as well as in English, they were able to get all of their kids Chromebooks and, and then they were able to get like 30 Wi-Fi spots. And so I would encourage principals to really kind of think on that systemic level um, because we know if, if states haven't explicitly said it, we know schools are shut down for the rest of this year. Everybody, everything shut down, right? And so that ability to have Wi-Fi and a Chromebook or whatever it is, it is really, really important to learning, but also to community. And so Megan, I'll go ahead and pass it over to you, how, how you decided um, you know, who teaches what in multiple times a day. Uh, thank you. Megan did not expect to come on right now. So really, really appreciate that. And <laughs> put any questions now you have for Megan as well, because we're all here and I'll turn this off on mine and I will get to progress monitoring. Awesome. Thanks, Emily. Yes. Apology for the way that I look, team. Um, so first, I think Emily might have oversold what we did there around the survey. I think the heart of it is is definitely true. We are not yet to 100% of our, our scholars getting Chromebooks and hotspots. Um, it takes, I mean, as I, all the people know on this call, just like a lot of follow up and relentless effort there. Um, and so what we are doing is probably like a lot of you is we're passing out food every week. Um, and so we're coupling that with technology um, pickup. And so we continue to put out a survey and then um, our teachers are having daily touch points with families that they're following up and then ensuring that they know that we're at school for a, a certain period of time so they can come get Chromebooks. Um, and we um, just, yeah, initially when we knew we shut down immediately thought, you know, we already have this technology in this building, let's get it out, you know, so someone can use it. Um, but also we're a really small school. We only serve 175 kids. So if you're on with a much larger school, I know that that's easier said than done. So I just wanted to kind of caveat that. Um, I think our biggest challenge that we have with our families is that um, the set schedule routine that Emily was talking about just doesn't really work with the environment um, and the realities of our children, uh, meaning like having a scheduled call, we initially tried and really found out, you know, one day the scholar might be with grandma, the next day they might be at a daycare, the, might, the next day they might be even tagging along in dad's truck as he's doing deliveries um, as parents are really trying to figure out childcare at this time. So what we've done is we've offered uh, three different calls, 10, one, and three that have um, our differentiated based on step levels. So at 10, we'll have seven different guided reading calls and have different links. Um, so kids are identified to what group they would go to. And if anyone's interested, I'm happy to send out how we did that and how we're rolling it out and what our distance learning website looks like to allow that. But they would hop on that call and then we have a teacher that's assigned to that time to lead. Um, and to Rachel's point, like what we don't have is the benefit of maybe knowing each scholar that well, because it does go across even not only classrooms, but grade level bands. Um, and so that is going to be, you know, a growing pain for our team. Um, but it was just kind of the reality of what we needed to do around the system of having multiple opportunities to engage in a guided reading call. Um, so, yeah, I think that's all you asked for, Emily. <laughs> that's, an, that's good. Oh, you're on mute. I can't hear you. Sorry. OK, great. Um, yeah, I think we'll have to all mute for a sec. Um, there we go. Um, yeah. So what Megan just offered is great because I have seen everything. I think it's I think it would be good to share again. If you if you want to be on the distance learning email, you just go on the website, put your stuff at the bottom. Um, the, the need survey is good to see. And then the second is 
Um, I do, Meg, you're going to say I'm overselling, I'm not overselling right now. So I think what Megan has, she is able to systema, systematize complex things in a very easy to read plan. So I've been working with principals and some people have a 30 page plan. I'm like, that's probably too many pages. But what Megan has in under 10 pages with everything their school has decided to do with tables, graphs. And so she's willing to share that. I'll put that in there. And then also the website that they have that they have created as well. OK, great. And trying to see if there are any new questions. Um, yeah, Megan, I think we're good there. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, and then we'll have get Rachel back up and okay a lot of people ask questions about progress monitoring um, and then for anybody let's just define what progress monitoring is progress monitoring doesn't mean you're trying to give an official assessment you're not trying to say okay did they hit benchmark at this round or are they on grade level no you just want a really accurate view of what they know and you want to get that in the fastest way possible so that you can adapt your instruction so i think four different people said hey what about what about progress monitoring could you do that over a screen Yes, really easily you could do that over a screen, but what you would have to do is have a child one on one. So my recommendation would be if you're trying to do some progress monitoring, give yourself a couple of weeks to progress monitor your kid and each time just ask if that child, you know, yes, the parent, can that child come 15 minutes early, right? And 15 minutes early, uh, if you know, is, we have people using FMP, we have people using STEP, but reading A to Z has great benchmark text. You, they have the great benchmark test. They have questions that go with them. You have to create your own big book intro, which is very important. They don't give you that. You have to have a good book intro. Um, and then you just put it up on the screen. And the nice thing with the progress monitoring, they don't got to read the whole book. You can do four pages. You, know, you can figure out what the calculation is to get 95% or whatever your goal is. You ask a few questions. Because again, this is our gut to know, can we push them up a level or do we need to stay where we are? So kind of in summary, yes, you got to have one on one time with kids and then be just just try reading A to Z's and, and keep it short and sweet to get that data that you need. And we will continue to talk about data collection tomorrow at the grades one and two. Somebody asked if there is still room. There is still room in that. So I went ahead and put that in our chat box. We still have openings for tomorrow. So you can go to the website, put your stuff in. We'll get you your invite today. And then our three, four is happening at the end of next week. We haven't finalized Thursday or Friday, but we'll finalize that today. Let me see where we are. Let me see if there are any more questions. Oh, great. Megan put all of her stuff in here. So you can see from uh, Megan Murphy, the first of the family survey. And then we have two more resources here. So that's awesome. And then let me see what we have coming in. Thank you. Thank you. OK, um, if I missed your question, just go ahead and retype it because I just might have missed it somewhere in the middle. We have seven minutes left together. We still have Rachel with us. I think she will let you ask her anything you want about instruction. So if we're getting to the point where we don't have guided reading questions and you have other questions you'd like to know, um, just go ahead and put them in there. And Rachel, while we wait there, can you just take a second and talk about anything you do with family investment um, to try and get people excited and to get people on the call? Um, okay, I am just the most annoying teacher in the world. And I just, we like, we have trackers like as a school, as an individual classroom, as a, as a teacher. Just trying to touch base with the t um, with each family at least um, once every couple of days, and so I mean it's so much easier these days, right? Whereas like when I first started teaching, it was calling, and that was like nearly impossible. Trying to get people's attention, you can do mass texts. We just go through and like if anything, I've been joking with like my other friends who are teachers. This is more work in a way than in the classroom because there's just so many points. This is just one part of the day. This is one. 20 25 minute block that we have with them 
But I, I, I guess this also speaks to more of the progress monitoring. We're doing like, we're setting up calls to do sight word tests. We're setting up calls to do, and those are quick, right? Like, hey, let's just go through our words really fast. Do you know these words? Um, we're setting up fluency, like fluency activities where they have one passage and they read um, over and over again throughout the week. Those are, those are other things that they're doing. They're doing computer programs, both Lexia um, for ELA and Zern for math. They're doing worksheets and packets that we have sent home. This is one part of the day that they are um, that they have like live instruction. My co-teacher also does math groups with them. So so right, like even though we're asking lots of questions around progress monitoring, it's the whole day. It's how involved and it, it generally it's like the more involved the parent is, the more it just kind of turns into this like you know, it's an unfair advantage in some ways, like parents who are just more involved have lots more touch points. Um, and then the other, um, and so they're just doing a lot more of the activities. And our school has like really rallied together and come up with so many resources for them. Kids are watching YouTube videos to check in as another point of progress monitoring. They're sending their work to us as pictures. We're like signing those off and saying like, yeah, that looks great, giving individual feedback. I think the more importantly than anything else, I think parents just want to know that you're there for them. And this is a hard time for them as well. We've been hearing that a lot. So as much as you can support parents, um, even like a quick call, even a quick text to say like you're doing a great like as much as our kids want to hear like you're doing a great job, our parents need to hear it more. So every time I'm talking to the parent, I'm saying you're doing a great job. I know it's hard. This is not your job. Um, and we're asking a lot of you. So thank you. And that seems to just get them to um, propel even more like to do more and to do more and to do more. So parents are just like the biggest ally that we have. Um, and then the other thing is just like the countless other things, right? Like check-ins that we do, we do um, group calls, we do just like play dates with the kids. We set up play dates and they just play with each other. They just look at each other um, and just get to like build. I know that they have, we have that across the school, but within our own classroom. So um like all of those touch points are super important at this time because it's so uncertain. I know that um, CPS just announced, like Chicago Public Schools just announced their close for the rest of the year. And we just assume that this is kind of the way that learning will go for the rest of the school year may, and maybe throughout 2020. Um, so being prepared for that, I think is really important to continue to give parents that support. Um, and whatever that means, I think I think it's kind of like I'm very much that like whatever it takes and like however, however many times I need to text you before that. Like, right. We have about 70. Um, what was our last number, Emily? Was it 75 percent of kids that are attending reading groups? It's like we're we're missing about like. Yeah, it's about 75 percent at this point. So we're missing about like three to four children who are coming regularly. Um, and that has a lot to do with like Internet connectivity, um, technology and that sorts of things. OK, um, I think the final question and then Rachel, I'm going to have you I'm going to put you on the spot and say, what is um, what are your final thoughts? What would you say to everybody? Didn't prepare you for that. Um, and then the other question in here was just, Rachel, do you do you tape your lessons and post them anywhere so that parents or children could view if they weren't there that day? Let me like switch you. I am muted. Well, we don't, we, I'm currently taping everything. There is a setting on Zoom where every single time you log into a call or host a call, it automatically is recording it and automatically saving it to my desktop. So I have them all saved. It's just, um, um, it's kind of tricky because the same kids that cannot attend the Zoom groups are also the kids who cannot then have access to watch later. Does that make sense? We're kind of like stuck in that bucket here. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's, yeah. My thing. Okay, Rachel, I'm gonna just put you on the spot. What would be your one or two or three lines of closing thoughts as people go out and try this on their own?
Yeah, I think you said it right earlier about community piece. Um, this could, this is becoming the time where we have um, the most insight to our students. And so taking advantage of that, I feel like I'm closer to my students now, almost like I have virtual tours of their homes. Like I um, see all their favorite stuffed animals and their favorite toys. Like there, this, there's been a bond that's been created over this time, which is really special. Um, and so like take advantage of that and like use that to your advantage. <laughs> um, I sometimes like use those types of things to talk about when we're when we're feeling like disengaged a little bit, right? Like bringing it back. Okay, Abraham, you get to show me your Pokemon cards later. If you like, I need you to read this first though. Like he's, you know, we want to buy them in. Um, and I think the last, I think the last two thoughts is like, this is a completely different sphere. It's a different atmosphere than the classroom. And I think trying to keep it as, um, as predictable as possible is wonderful. But I also, I think it's really hard to be prescriptive in this moment, right? Like it really depends on the book and the child and the levels that they're at. So like, just go with the flow, enjoy this time. Like, and then it's, it, I think it could be like so, so scary, but I feel every time that I log on, like I've got nothing to lose. We just are doing stuff where at least the very minimum is that we get to hang out together and that we get to learn more about each other, right? So keep it moving and don't and don't expect so much out of yourself. Don't be hard on yourself um, and just and just really like just be generous to them and just be generous to yourself as we are all learning during this time. So thank you all. Let me see. OK, Rachel, we are all giving you a virtual round of applause and we are so thankful. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, to everyone that has joined us today, thank you. And we are right at 4.01. We are going to have another webinar tomorrow at 2.30 p.m. for grades one and two and the following week with grades three, four and five. I went ahead here also in the chat box and put if you are someone who uses Twitter, we are just launching a Twitter account mostly to be able to help in this time. We'll put the webinar there and then, of course, go to the website if you want any more um, resources as they come out. And thank you very, very much and have a wonderful afternoon.